Judges chapter 6. So continuing to look at uh, principles of revival from the life of Gideon and uh, strategically um, even my teaching at the moment I'm bringing like a battering ram because of the, the prophetic words that God has given us in regards to breakthrough and we're uh, we've been stuck at the gate of breakthrough for over a year and a half. We've not seen that breakthrough. And there's been a lot of contending at the gates. And um, individuals are coming under attack and, and different things like that in the group. So what I want to do is with the word of the Lord come as a battering ram with the word of the Lord. And with principles from scripture of breakthrough and revival. And so, um, you know, you reap what you sow. So if I'm going to be sowing seed of these principles of breakthrough and revival... I believe that we're going to start to reap at the right time when harvest comes, Amen. breakthrough and revival. And uh, some of you might remember that um, it was actually the beginning of the Hebrew year last October, the beginning of the new Hebrew year, and I gave a number of uh, prophetic words based on the 5777. Uh, this is the year of the Messianic ruling sword. Uh, that's what seven represents. And we've got not one but three Messianic ruling swords. And... I gave a number of prophetic words and messages on the concept of girding our loins. Um, and uh, you can go back, it's on our website, the, the messages, but to gird your loins. And uh, we, we lose it in modern English translations, but uh, most of the, uh, like the old King James, for example, and in even the new King James in places, they continue to have the word to gird your loins. It says to gird up your, your mind, which is really to gird the loins of your mind. And, and, uh, in ancient times, uh, when uh, they had these long skirt-like uh, dresses that men would wear, and um, praise God we've gone beyond that, but anyway, um, except for Scotland. Um, but the thing was, that when they had to work in the fields, they had to pull up that dress-type thing that they were wearing, and they had to tuck it into their girdle, and it would make like shorts. And, um, and so they'd have to gird their loins... That's what's called girding your loins as you lift it up so that you can work hard in the field in order to get the harvest. Um, the next reason that you had to gird your loins was uh, when you had to run. If you're a messenger and you have to run with a message or if you're a warrior that has to run into battle, um, that you had to gird your loins because when you're trying to run with this long dress-like thing on, you trip over and you fall. Um, if you don't gird your loins, you're hindered in your forward progress. So you gird your loins so you could run fast or run swiftly. Um, and then uh, you also, finally, you gird your loins as warriors because when you're in battle, you have to move fast and jump around and different things. And so you have to gird your loins, you tuck it into your girdle so that you can fight fiercely. And I release that word that we need to gird up the loins of our minds. We need to prepare for war and uh, so that we can run fast as the messengers of the Lord. And we can run swiftly in the battle so that we can work hard for the harvest and that we can fight fiercely for the victory. And, uh, and so this is something I remind, uh, remind us all of. Because I know there's many of you, you know you are in the midst of some form of battle. Mm. There is opposition of the enemy. Things are happening in your life, discouraging things. And uh, if you don't gird the loins of your mind, then you listen to the word of the enemy. And, and his discouraging word guides and leads you. Mm. And see, when you listen to the word of the enemy, instead of... Because faith comes by hearing the word of the Lord. That's how we gird our loins of our mind is we hear the word of the Lord and we agree with it no matter what the facts or the evidence of what's going on in our life would say. We say the fact of the truth of God in heaven is greater than all of the reality, all of the evidence of what I see and feel in the natural. That, that's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. And what's, to gird the loins of our mind. And so what happens is the enemy tries to look at, the, look at your situation, look at your financial situation, or, or look at your health at the moment, look at your marriage at the moment, uh, look at your problems at the moment. And the enemy always tries to get you to focus on facts of what you see and hear in the natural. And they are facts. We need to be aware of those things so we can bring them to the Lord in prayer. Amen? Amen. Uh, but, but primarily... Above and beyond the facts of what you see and feel in the natural, 
Um, and you, you've got to be careful, not listen to the voice of the enemy because fear comes in your heart and then you can't work hard for the harvest. You'll, you'll, you'll give up, you'll lose hope. And, uh, and if you lose hope, if you don't plant seed and work hard for the harvest, you won't get a harvest. It just stands to reason. Um, you won't be able to run swiftly with your message because you've lost hope, you, you know, and, and, and it's worthless. Um, and you're not going to fight fiercely because you've lost your hope in victory. Um, and so I, I release those words. I want to remind you of them at the moment in the context of the message we're about to go into. Mm. And, uh, and in the context of this whole thing of the battering ram and coming. You know, when I was a missionary, I, I went out at the age of 20 uh, with a very strong, clear word from the Lord that God was calling me to be uh, an apostolic pioneer into the eastern regions of Tibet. Um, this is back in 1990. And, um, and so what happened, I was the first Christian missionary at the age of 20 to go into eastern Tibet. Two million people, there was no other full-time ministry m missionaries. There's a couple of people that were going there to pray, and there's some people that had a heart for that area. But there's no one that was full-term, 100% focused on pioneering that region. I was, I was the spearhead of what God was doing into eastern Tibet. And I tell you, when you come up against the gates of hell, then all hell breaks loose against you. Mm -hmm. This is part of spiritual warfare. This is part of, if, we want to, if, if, if you are serious that you want to see spiritual breakthrough, then you're going to have to seriously commit yourself to warfare. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've got to understand the principles of breakthrough, the principles of war warfare. Number one principle is be a worshipper. Mm -hmm. The worshippers become the warriors, be number one, God-focused, and hear His voice. Minister to the Lord, hear His voice, be in His presence. Don't look and see what you see in the natural. It's got to come from the commander-in-chief in the third heaven. Uh, that's the first uh, uh, principle of winning in spiritual warfare, is you run and you, and you war according to His word. Um, and so I was sent in. And uh, praise God, I did have some people around about me that had a heart for Tibet. They would pray and fast regularly. But I'll tell you, everything went wrong. Mm. I turned up there to do a course to study the language of Eastern Tibet. There was no teachers. There was no course. They told me, you need to study another language. Um, and I had to contend just to learn the language. I had to set my face as a flint, and I just refused. And I, and I said, I, I won't. And this is in Communist China, and I'm refusing. And I said, you promised... Uh, you signed a contract, and I signed this contract, and you need to keep your word. And I, and I would go up to the head office of the university, and I would literally just, I, I, I set my face as a flint. I'm not studying any other languages. So I study Chinese to China. I said, God has not called me to study Chinese. Um, I, I, well, I didn't say that. I said, I, I, I've not signed a contract. I'm coming to China. You can't say God said. So I said, I, I've not signed a contract to study Chinese. I've signed a contract to study um, Tibetan language, especially the calm language. But what I'm saying is everything went wrong. Mm. It's like, the, you know, when God calls you to something, usually the opposite happens. Mm. It's, like a, it's, it's like a spiritual paradox, you know. It's, it, as soon as God gives you a promise that He's going to do something in you, you look at Joseph, you know, He's going to be ruling and His brother's going to bow down in honor and His father will bow. And so that's the word, the vision of the Lord. And He shares it with His brothers. And instead of them bowing down and honoring Him, they hate His guts and they, and they throw Him in a pit and they sell Him to slave traders. You know, and He ends up in a, a slave in Egypt. It's like the opposite of everything that God promised happens. And that's what happened to me when I went into Eastern Tibet. And, and, and I had to fight and pray. I'd go out fasting and praying until I could see that eventually I got a teacher and, and, and they set things up. And then they wouldn't give me permissions to travel from uh, the Chinese city of Chengdu into eastern Tibet. And, and I had to pray and fast. It took a whole year, but we eventually saw breakthrough. Um, and I remember at that time, it's just... Uh, I had to set my face as a flint, and, and everything was opposing me. And there was spiritual warfare breaking out against me, discouraging things happening. And um, I had to hold on to God, and, and, and standing on the prophetic promises was key. I just keep declaring over myself the prophetic promises and what God has declared to me. And, and the people around me that knew about uh, the apostolic and prophetic ministry of pioneering new territories, they kept reminding me of the promises and praying over the promises with me. Um, and so I became like the spearhead, and they were the spear shaft. And you know, every spearhead needs a spear shaft, lest it has no power. And you need people behind you. Even the Apostle Paul says, Pray for me, 
join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Even the Apostle Paul knew to be successful in his apostolic ministry, he needed people behind him supporting him with prayer and intercession and encouragement. And, um, and, I, and I just reminded you in the Spirit, myself and Hyunmi, for this breakthrough, you all come in behind us with your prayers, your intercession, your words of encouragement. Us as a company setting our faces a flint to the target of what God has called us to. Because, you know, any archer that doesn't have a target, you know, you're going to shoot your friends if you're not careful. Like, seriously, blindfold me. I hope I hit something. That's how people live their spiritual lives. Gee, I hope I hit something for God. You've got to know what God's called you into. You've got to know the target. And individually, but also corporately, if God's called you in the lion's roar, uh, let me tell you this, you haven't joined the Smoky Flower Church. <laughs> You haven't joined the, the River of Grace Church. You've joined Lion's Roar. Um, the name itself should tell you something. We are a contending house of prayer. Um, we have, like every battleship, we have a little hospital section for wounded people. But our goal, we want to heal you so you rise up as a warrior. We don't want to have a continual healing counseling service ship. You know, um, that's not who we are. We are a man of war ship of the Lord a contending house of prayer. And so you've got to know corporately what you're called into. And you've got to actually, you say, God, what have you called me to? Well, if he's called you to Lions Roar, he's called you to our vision. Okay, and that's the thing. And if God hasn't called you to the vision, then I'm very sad when people leave. I really am. Uh, but maybe God called you somewhere else. And sometimes people that jump ship as well. I don't feel I'm called to the man of war. I feel like I'm called to the lifeboat ministry. You know, I'm going to jump out and grab the lifeboat. Um, but anyway, this is where we are, and um, in Tibet, I did see breakthroughs, but there's a prophetic word people started giving over me in that season, because it was so hard, but I wouldn't give up, I wouldn't give up, and they said, oh, Glenn, whenever we see you, we see a battering ram, and it's like you're just coming up against the gates of Hades, and you're not stopping, and they were giving the word of what I was doing, but that word was encouraging me, because I started to see myself like this battering ram in the spirit, I am not going to give up, and... And uh, I eventually uh, was a spearhead, spearheaded the eastern region of Tibet. We saw it get opened up. It was closed to foreigners. It was totally closed when I started. And uh, I actually had direct confrontation with the demonic principalities over the region. I saw them. I contended with them. And uh, that area then opened up to the point that the, the Chinese government allowed foreigners in there. And, and, and later on, anywhere up to 35 missionaries at one point were going in and out of that region. Mm. Um, and so there's a major breakthrough into the region. So um, th th there's something of what God has called us to as Lions Royal House of Prayer. We are not an ordinary church with an ordinary church mandate. Understand that. And so we're not, I'm not a pastor. That's not my gift. That's not my calling. I'm not pastoral at all. Um, I'm, I'm an apostle and a prophet. And so we're an apostolic prophetic company. So... Um, you know, I, I, I do care about people. I think every leader has a pastoral need. You need to care about people that are struggling. You know, we, we call people up and we have people come over for dinner and, and, and we sit down and we'll pray for you. But I'm not a pastor. So don't expect from me pastoral ministry as a primary. Um, I want to care for you, again, that there's, there's that responsibility. But I'm an apostle and I'm a prophet. Um, and apostles and prophets, they are groundbreakers. They're pioneers. And therefore, Lions Royal House of Prayer has a destiny, an apostolic prophetic destiny. And we've, we've, we've suffered a lot of opposition coming into Brisbane, especially from Korean churches, just our name. Our name. And, and talking about the apostolic and the prophetic, we were labeled a cult. Um, but God told me before we came to Brisbane, and He told me, You will call this house of prayer Lions Roar. And He said, When you go to Brisbane, you will face, you'll come into a direct confrontation with the demonic stronghold of religious tradition that's in the Korean churches. And we did. We were labeled a cult within five weeks or six weeks. There's only five of us. Hey, Jinnah. Jinnah was there. There's only five of us, and like, we must have been a threat or something. Anyway, just to lay those foundations. So we're in Judges chapter 6, and we're going to talk today about Gideon's 300. Gideon's 300. Make sure I got all my notes. Got to stay on my battle plan. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I'm just going to start, uh, read the first part of the story. Uh, we're in chapter 6. Let's go to chapter 6. This is after uh, Gideon has torn down the altar of Baal in his father's backyard. His father was the high priest of Baal, the leading Baal worship in the region. And so Gideon had to oppose his father and his family. And he tore down the, the altar of Baal and then established in its place the altar of Yahweh. And then verse 33, In response to this, now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples joined forces, and they crossed over the Jordan, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him, or to meet against them. Okay, so what happens here? As soon as Gideon, he, he fulfills his first assignment, he tears down the altar of Baal, establishes the altar of the Lord, uh, and there's a public declaration. He's got a nickname now called the Baal Conqueror. Uh, he's the guy, let Baal contend with, means if anyone's going to stand against Gideon, let Baal do it, let man not do it. And so his, the Baal conqueror was his name, Jerob Baal. And, uh, but as soon as he has this initial great breakthrough, and he's ready now to raise up the army of the Lord, then all of the forces of all of the enemies suddenly break out against him. And uh, again, this is a, a principle of spiritual warfare. When David was finally, after many years in the wilderness, and then he was ruling over Ju uh, Judah for a number of years, and, and the other tribes of Israel refused to acknowledge David as king for many years, and there was a battle between the house of Saul and the house of David. And uh, by the way, from the 5th to the 9th of July, we have our winter intensive, and as part of our winter intensive, we're looking at the King Saul syndrome and the King David antidote. Because we do live right now in the church, there, we, we live at the time of the battle between the house of Saul and the house of David. And, and I'll go into more explanation of what that is in the intensive, but uh, we don't want to be part of the house of Saul church. The house of Saul church is all about making your own name great. The leader wants to build his own kingdom. He wants to make his own name great. Um, he's all about building memorials for himself. Um, he is a man of the flesh. That is the house of Saul. Um, they're all about building, a, in the eyes of men, something great, um, but not really considering what is great in the eyes of God, whereas the house of David is all about building something that is great in the eyes of God. The house of David was built upon praise and worship. It's making God's name famous in the earth. It's a totally different spirit. And, um, and our mandate is to be part of the house of David as the line of the tribe of Judah's house. That was, Judah was David's tribe. Okay. And when David finally gets acknowledged king over all of Israel, it says the five kings of the Canaanites, with all of their armies assembled, and they invaded Israel. Why? They're coming to kill David. Can you imagine? Five kings with all their armies, and they're after you. You know, like there's five demonic kings with all their demonic spirits, and they say, your name is on their target list as number one. You know, public enemy number one for the powers of darkness. And... You know, um, but the amazing thing is, it says David, when he saw and heard this, he withdrew into his stronghold. It doesn't mean he retreated from the battle, but he retreated into his stronghold and he declared in the Psalms, The Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my strong tower. The Lord is my fortress. In him I trust. And so he retreats into his stronghold, which is a picture of like an, an archer with an arrow. You pull the arrow back so you can launch it out with power. There's got to be thrust in an arrow. If you try to just drop an arrow out of a bow, it just doesn't go anywhere. It has no power. You've got to draw it back, but we draw back into the heart of the Lord. He's the archer. We draw back into the heart of the Lord. This is the stronghold there. The heart of the Lord is our stronghold. And then David says, Lord, what is your will? Will you give me victory over my enemies this day? And the Lord says, yes, I will. So go and do such and such. And the Lord gave him a battle strategy and so David then rose up with the word of the Lord that the enemy would be handed into his hands and he attacked the enemy, the Philistine kings. And it says, Then the Lord broke out as water that breaks through a dam. When a dam bursts, and suddenly you've got this dam that's full of water and it just smashes out with a flood. And, and it says, The Lord burst forth like a dam that was bursting forth. 
And the Lord himself, through David and his company, defeated all the enemy. And then David named that place of victory Baal Perizim. Baal meaning master, Perizim meaning of the breakthrough. And he declares, our God is the master of the breakthrough. And um, so there's that story going on. So the same thing happens here for Gideon. As soon as he wins this initial great victory and he's ready to call the armies of God together, the enemy breaks out against him. Mm. Um, so next time when all hell breaks loose against you, you know why. Mm. You become a threat. Mm. Now, Hume and I are often on the mission field and even in ministry now, when all hell starts breaking loose against us and, 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 and there's gossip or slander or things are going wrong, and then Hume looks at me and goes, Glenn, we must be doing something right. Yeah. You know? Um, so this is a sign. We're not, the enemy is not happy. You know, When the enemy never attacks you, you get worried because you are not being a threat. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Christians, you can have your happy clappy time of coffee and chocolate cake and, <laughs> and at your flower power church if you want, um, but you are not a threat to the powers of darkness. Um, and when you're a threat to the powers of darkness, individually or corporately, uh, the powers of darkness... They will do all that they can to see that you do not fulfill your destiny. They have schemes. They have strategies. They have distractions. They do not want you to plug in to God and plug into the company of God. So when you plug in something, it gets the power yeah. so that it can fulfill its purpose. If you, want to, if you want to look at a computer and you don't plug it in, you look at a blank screen. And you've got to, we've got to plug in the, comp- the company that God sets us into. And the interesting thing... As soon as all the enemies come, Gideon gets his shofar. But but what happens is it says, the spirit of the living God came, and the Hebrew says, clothed himself in Gideon. Mm -hmm. Now, I talked about that before. I just think it's a powerful picture. We all know what it means to put on the armor of God. Mm -hmm. And we need to put on the armor of God. That's who we are in Christ. We put on the armor of God, who we are in Christ. But here... The Spirit of Christ puts on Gideon. How would you like that? Jesus Christ, the mighty man of war, the the, the commander of the heavenly host, he wants to march in the battle, and so he decides to put you on as his armour. You look like my armour. I'm going to put you on. I'm going to wear you as I march forth into war. That's what happens to Gideon. It's not just who we are in Christ, it's who Christ is in us. And so Gideon is now... He he clothes the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit fills himself with Gideon. Gideon becomes the armor of the Lord, and then Gideon blows a shofar with that anointing, and he gathers 32,000 warriors from all across the nation of Israel, which actually wasn't a huge number, because there's several million Israelites out there. So... He starts with an army of 32,000. Uh, we looked at the Gideon laying the fleeces at the threshing floor. And that word, to thresh or to sift, where you would, uh, the idea of a threshing floor, and that's where he's in the place, the valley of decision. You know, uh, is God saying to attack with my 32,000 or not? Is God really saying this? Do I really hear from God? And, and so Gideon is seeking the will of the Lord. That's what we looked at last week. Seeking the will of the Lord. Knowing the will of the Lord. Getting a clear mandate of what he is saying. But he's at the threshing floor. Will I or won't I? And, and at the threshing floor, they would, they would separate the chaff from the wheat. The, the wheat grain is what they would make the bread out of. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, the bread we saw, the word for bread is in the word for war in the Hebrew language. Because they realize if you don't get the bread the living bread, the living manna, who is Christ, the Word of God. If we don't have that bread within us, if we don't have the Word of God, the living active sword of the Lord in us, then we don't have strength to wage warfare. But if you don't wage war, you lose your harvest, you lose your bread. It's it's which comes first, the chicken or the egg scenario. You know, does bread come first or does strength come first? Well, you know, the eating of the the living manna, the living bread, 